Hello, I'm Blendini, and this is the second tutorial in a series about materials. This tutorial provides an in-depth look at Blender's principal shader in terms of the behavior of light. Understanding how light interacts with different materials helped me get the most out of the principal shader, and hopefully you'll find it helpful too. So let's get started. When light hits the surface of a material, it will behave in one of three primary ways. Absorption occurs when a material converts light energy into a different form, often heat. Reflection occurs when light bounces off the material. A transmission occurs when light passes through the material. Refraction, a type of transmission, occurs when light passes through the material and bends. Absorption, reflection, transmission, and refraction are the primary behaviors of light when it interacts with matter. So it makes sense that these are represented in the principal shader. All materials absorb, reflect, and transmit light. The material's molecular structure determines the amount of absorption, reflection, and transmission that occurs. The principal shader determines how light scatters when it interacts with your material, which means we can discuss its functionality in terms of light behaviors, beginning with absorption. Absorption is the process of light energy being converted to a different form of energy. Absorbed light is never seen again, and it is this behavior that is responsible for the colors we see. Visible white light is comprised of colors, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet, with each color of light having its own frequency. When a material matches the frequency of a color, it absorbs it. Colors that are not absorbed are reflected back, resulting in the color that we see. If an object reflects all of the visible spectrum, it appears white. If an object absorbs the entire spectrum, it appears black. We can set the color several ways, using a six-digit hex code value, using HSV values, uh, which operate on a scale of 0 to 1, where hue is the color along the visible spectrum, saturation is intensity of the color, and value is the brightness of the color. We can also use RGB values, which allow us to specify the degree of red, green, and blue, also using a scale of 0 to 1. We can also use a color picker slash eyedropper to select color from anywhere in Blender, even an open image. Understanding absorption has little impact on color picking, but it really comes into play with subsurface scattering. Nearly all nonmetals exhibit some degree of subsurface scattering. We commonly associate it with organic materials like creature skin, plants and fruits, milk, wax, honey, and jellies. But subsurface scattering is also present in inorganic nonmetals like marble, jade, paper, and many plastics. Essentially, subsurface scattering is the process that makes an object appear translucent, where light passes some distance into the object, but we can't see through it. It's a subtle effect, but it can have a dramatic impact on the realism of your renders. Subsurface scattering in Blender's principal shader depends on the subsurface slider, subsurface color, and the subsurface radius. The subsurface scattering slider mixes between surface light scattering when light interacts with the object's surface and base color, and subsurface light scattering when light passes through the surface of an object and interacts with the subsurface color. Imagine that beneath the surface of a material is a subsurface made of particles. Light passes through the surface into the subsurface. Some light rays will interact with the subsurface particles and through absorption, they adopt the color of the subsurface material. These rays may continue to bounce around within the subsurface before either diminishing entirely or exiting the material and returning to the viewer's eyes. When we adjust the subsurface slider, we are mixing the surface and subsurface properties together. A value of zero represents all light reflecting off the object's surface, and a value of one represents all light passing through the surface and interacting with the subsurface adopting its color, and returning it to our eyes. For most real-world cases, subsurface scattering will be between 0.01 and 0.1, representing a small amount of light passing through the surface. But if we set it to 0.5, we'll see the effect more clearly. At this setting, we can clearly see some of the traits of subsurface scattering. The edges of our model appear brighter, and the overall surface of the mesh looks softer. But having radically different colors for these values is pretty uncommon in real-world materials. When we cut into a piece of marble beneath the surface, we just see more marble. The surface and subsurface are the same color. 
This is usually the case in real world objects, so a good place to start when working with subsurface scattering is to set your base color and your subsurface color to the same or a similar value. This cube has subsurface and surface colors set to white. To minimize light sources, I set the world lighting to zero. With no subsurface, we see the regular cube. The faces facing the light are illuminated, and the faces not facing the light are in shadow. As we increase subsurface scattering, we allow more light to pass into the subsurface where it illuminates areas that would otherwise be in shadow. The overall surface appears softer, the edges are brighter, and a reddish-orange color now stretches into the area in shadow. This coloring is a result of the subsurface radius. Light that passes through the surface travels a certain distance before it is absorbed. Before it is absorbed, the light retains its color. Remember that white light is comprised of all colors, and these colors can be derived from red, green, and blue. The subsurface radius specifies how far each color of light, red, green, or blue, travels beneath the surface before it is absorbed by subsurface particles. The colors of the visible light spectrum are distinguished, among other qualities, by wavelength. Blue and violet have the lowest wavelengths, while red and orange have the highest wavelengths. Colors with shorter wavelengths are scattered more and absorbed sooner than colors with higher wavelengths. This means blue and violet are more likely to be visible closer to the surface on thin areas where it has scattered more but has yet to be absorbed. Red light travels deeper into the subsurface, retaining its color longer before it is absorbed. Let's take a look at this in Blender. If we increase each subsurface radius value to 1, we see the full distance white light travels beneath the surface with these settings. For this demo, a 1000 watt light is close to the object and subsurface is set to 0.5. If we zero out blue and green and set red to 1, red light travels the full distance. If we set red to 0.5, the distance is cut in half. Here, red and green are 0 and blue is set to 0.1, roughly 10% of the light beam's distance. Adding in green gives us the combination of blue and green, or cyan, for the 10%, and then only green for 10 to 20%. With the default settings, red, blue, and green travel 10% of the light beam's distance into the subsurface, making white light. When blue falls out of the equation, the remaining red and green light make yellow. And when green falls out, red travels the remaining distance. This is why we see the coloring we see when we enable subsurface scattering. Even though subsurface radius is a vector input, we can still use an RGB color input node to control this. I'll set the RGB node's color values to the radius default values and connect it to the subsurface radius socket. The light scattering is more noticeable with a more complex model, so I'll add a monkey head to the stage with the same material. The colors with the smallest radius value, blue, is most noticeable on thin areas facing the light, since blue light scatters closest to the surface. We can see this effect around the thin parts of the monkey's eye sockets. The colors with the highest value, red, are most noticeable in thin areas facing away from the light. These light rays pass through the thin parts of the mesh entirely without being absorbed. This is why thin areas of our own skin appear to glow reddish orange when illuminated from behind, just like this monkey's ears. These default radius values accurately capture the ratio of light dispersion by color through a material subsurface, but different materials have different variations on this. Take a look at this chart. I'm not sure of its origin, but its content comes from a Pixar paper. I've put links to both in the description. Notice that the radius values are all different, but they observe the same trend. Red scatters the furthest into the material before interacting with subsurface particles. Blue scatters the shortest distance, and green usually falls between red and blue. We can import this chart into Blender's image editor and use the color picker to set these values. Since subsurface and surface are often the same, we can connect an RGB input to both. Since the radius is a vector input with colors for each channel, we can use the RGB input for the radius and set the subsurface mixer to the value shown on the chart.
This chart is a great resource for developing subsurface materials, and these pointers will hopefully provide a good starting place for any subsurface material. Nearly all nonmetals exhibit some degree of subsurface scattering. Surface and subsurface colors are almost always the same. In railroad cases, subsurface ranges between 0.01 and 0.1, and also in railroad cases, subsurface radius colors conform to the absorption qualities of visible light. This means red, the color less likely to be absorbed, will be the highest value, followed by green and then blue. All right, that was probably more than you ever wanted to know about subsurface scattering, but there's one more thing to discuss, distribution options. Depending on your model, the appearance of subsurface scattering might be greatly affected by the calculations that determine how light scatters. These options affect the number of light bounces modeled when light scatters above, or in this case, beneath the surface. As of Blender 2.93.4, we have two subsurface distribution options. The default distribution option is christensen burley Its scattering is less accurate than a random walk, but the results are sufficient for most cases, and the render time is less. In some cases, the image may appear darker than expected and somewhat muted or dull, with fewer details at fine levels. The second option is random walk, which is a more accurate cycles-only option that produces better results at the cost of increased render time and increased noise in the image. The improved modeling of subsurface light bounces results in more light bouncing around below the surface. More light will retain more details. We also get more accurate modeling of light bounces on thinner surfaces where the blue and green light rays are more dominant. These renders demonstrate the time quality trade-off of subsurface scattering and its distributions. All other settings were kept constant. The next group of sliders affect reflection. There are three primary types of reflection that occur when light hits a surface. Diffuse, where light scatters fairly evenly and no reflections are carried on the surface. Metallic, where light reflects uniformly and maintains reflected images on the surface. Specular, a mix of diffused and uniform reflections capable of reflecting images on its surface. All reflections follow the law of reflection, which states that an incidence ray hits a surface at an angle and reflects around an imaginary line perpendicular to the surface, called the surface normal. The reflection ray forms an angle with the surface normal, called the angle of reflection, that is equal to the angle of incidence formed by the incidence ray. All materials fit into two categories, metals and nonmetals are dielectrics. These categories exist because metals and dielectrics have specific behaviors and properties, especially when it comes to light. We use the metallic slider for metals and the specular slider for nonmetals. There are very few real world cases of materials that exhibit both properties, so when working with metals, the slider should be set to 1 and the specular should be set to 0. When working with dielectrics, metallic should be set to 0 and specular should be set to 0.5. Depending on your model, there may be little difference between the specular values of 0.5 and 1, but 0.5 matches real world specularity and exceeding that might result in artificial looking materials. Given what I just said, there are a few exceptions that I've found. One is satin metallic paints where bits of metal are mixed into non-metallic paint. It's very common on cars. You'll be able to see it a bit when I bump up the specular here. Another scenario is white metallic paint, which is white, not silver, as shown here. Just two examples of an otherwise pretty rare material effect, and I think the general rule still applies specular or metallic in most of your materials. Here are the full renders of each case for comparison. In general, metallic and specular don't mix because metals and nonmetals employ different light behaviors to produce a reflection. Metals high reflectivity results from the process of absorption. Light is absorbed by the metal's free electrons that vibrate to a higher level, but quickly fall back down to a lower level. As they return to the lower level, they discharge a photon, or light particle, which is the reflection ray. This is an incredibly fast process that results in a small amount of the light being absorbed, while most of the light, around 95%, is reflected back. Light rays that bounce off an object onto a metal surface are reflected in a uniform fashion to the viewer, resulting in a mirror light reflection. Since metallic reflection is a byproduct of absorption, the reflected light is tinted in the color of the metal. 
Silver metals absorb and reflect light relatively equally, and reflections don't appear tinted. But colored metals like gold or copper absorb blue and violet light, resulting in reflections that are tinted by the colors reflected back to us. The reflectivity of dielectrics comes from refraction. Light passes through the surface of the material a short distance, bends beneath the surface, possibly interacting with particles until light bounces out of the object and is reflected back to us. With dielectrics, areas aligned with the light source and viewer will reflect the full light source, resulting in specular highlights. In this scene, we have an object with specular reflection. The camera acts as our eye line. It is set up to track this empty object that will sit on the specular reflection. The camera and light are at a similar distance from the object and a similar height. If we view from the top and measure these angles, we will see the angle of reflection is equal to the angle of incidence. This behavior is true for every specular reflection on the object. Any place on the object not meeting this criteria reflects light in a diffused pattern. If you have ever applied specular tint, you may have noticed that your model seemed less reflective. When dielectrics reflect light, the specular highlights always appear white or significantly lighter than the rest of the model. Specular tint gives you an opportunity to force the specular highlight to adopt more of the base color, essentially making the specular highlights less bright. This doesn't occur in nature, so if your aim is photorealism, leave specular tint set to zero. For both metallic and specular reflection, the intensity of the reflection results from the smoothness or roughness of the surface. Here, these arrows represent light rays uniformly reflecting off of this smooth surface. By adding displacement to this surface, we can mimic the effect of microfacets, microscopic imperfections along the surface that cause reflection rays to scatter. This scattering reduces the intensity and sharpness of images reflected on the object's surface. A value of zero represents a completely smooth surface, while one scatters light so much that the object appears diffuse. Next, we'll cover these reflection parameters that are for special cases. When you think of anisotropic, think of stretching the reflection of light in a particular direction. Anisotropy means certain properties of a material behave differently based on direction. One example of this is wood, which is stronger with the grain than across it. In a principal shader, the property that changes with direction is the intensity of the reflection. Anisotropic reflections appear to stretch across the object linearly or radially around a center point. This effect is only visible in render view in cycles. Being a reflection effect, its appearance changes based on the lighting, so if your lighting isn't bright enough or in the right spot, you might not see this effect. Anisotropic reflections are most common on metallic products with a brushed metal effect that results in fine lines on the surface traveling in the direction of the brushing. When light hits brushed metal, the reflection is stretched perpendicular to the groove direction. When the groove patterns are circular across a flat surface, the light stretches perpendicular to the brushing rings, forming a radial pattern around a center point. Let's explore this feature using the default cube. I'll set the material to full metallic and full anisotropy. Notice how the light seems to stretch out from a center point in a radial fashion. Blenders and anisotropic reflections use a tangent input to determine what surfaces should exhibit the anisotropic effect. Essentially, the axis the radial effect rotates around is the tangent. By default, the tangent is the z-axis and the type of reflection is radial. With the default settings, an object's tangent is defined by the object's local orientation. An object's local orientation can be different from the global orientation. When we rotate this, its local z-axis, which passes through the top and bottom of the object, is now aligned with the global y-axis. Despite the object's orientation in the scene, its local orientation stays with the object, as does the anisotropic effect. Because of this, applying rotation can give us unexpected results when it resets the object's local orientation to align with the global orientation. This can easily be fixed, however, by telling Blender to generate the radial reflection around a different axis by using the tangent input. In the node editor, shift A to add a tangent node to the material and connect it to the tangent input on the principal shader. The default setting of the tangent node matches the default anisotropic setting, so connecting it as is won't result in a change. But we can select X or Y to center the radial effect around either axis. 
In addition to changing the tangent, we can rotate the effect around the tangent axis using an isotropic rotation. This value rotates the reflections with zero being no rotation and one creating a full circle around the tangent axis. So far, we've used objects whose origin aligns perfectly with that of its bounding box, an imaginary cube that fully surrounds your object. We can see the bounding box by going to Object Properties, Viewport Display, and checking Bounds. While Tangent tells Blender what surface to apply the effect to, the bounding box's center determines where the anisotropic's effect is centered. The bounding box's center moves if the shape it surrounds changes. For example, if we extend a part of this object to make a handle, the bounding box's center moves and so does the center of our anisotropic effect. To correct this, we can use the texture coordinate node to define the precise location of the anisotropy center. If we choose object and connect it to the tangent input, the effect centers on the object's origin point along the default axis, the z-axis. If we want the effect on the top of this surface, we need to align the local axis with the global axis by applying rotation. This works as long as the origin is located where you want the effect to be. But what if the origin point is not where we want the effect to originate? We can use any other object to mark the center, so let's add an empty. On the texture coordinate node, select the empty as our object. The radial anisotropy effect is now centered on that selected empty. Place the empty wherever you want to see the effect on your object. We need to parent the empty to the object to keep the effect in place, but before we do that, we need to apply any scaling. Now we can use Control P and select Object Keep Transform to parent the empty to the object. When we move the object, the reflection moves with it. This option gives us precise control over the placement of anisotropic radial lighting effects, but what if the effect isn't radial? On many real-world objects, the anisotropy reflect is linear, not radial. We can create this effect using the UV map option. To better demonstrate this, I'm going to make this look more like a pot first. I'll inset and extrude the top face, add some edge loops, adjust the position of the empty so it rests on the object's surface, and then add a subsurface modifier. I'm renaming this material to radial, then I'm going to select the sides of the pot that will have a linear anisotropic effect and assign them to a different material. When UV map is the tangent input, Blender treats the U axis of the UV map as the direction the light should be stretched in. Imagine a light ray stretching horizontally across your UV map of your object. With that in mind, we can align the faces that need the vertical stretching effect to the U axis of our UV map. Let's take a closer look at this using a simple grid object. Tab into edit mode to see its default UV map. Set metallic and anisotropy to one, and we'll see the default radial effect around the Z axis. If I change radial to UV map, the light stretches across the grid horizontally, which corresponds with the U axis of the UV map. Where the reflection appears along the v-axis is a function of the light source location. The UV map is only telling Blender how to orient the linear stretching of the reflection. If we want to change the direction of the stretching, we can rotate the UV map, keeping in mind that the light will always stretch across the U-axis. We can also select specific faces and change the reflection on them. Select a few rows of the grid, and in the UV editor, rotate those faces 90 degrees. The reflection on the selected faces also rotates 90 degrees, but the original reflection remains on the untouched faces. Using a UV map gives us extreme control over anisotropic reflections. We can adjust the faces we want any way we want. If I take a selection of faces and rotate them randomly, we can randomize the anisotropic reflection, creating patterns like this. That's great for a simple plane, but how does this work with a more complex object like our pot? Let's connect a tangent node and set it to UV map. With the default mapping, the reflection stretches horizontally around the pot, but we want the reflection to stretch vertically. I'll add seams and unwrap the object again. The inner and outer sides of the pot are now aligned with the V axis. The reflection runs along the U axis, matching the orientation of these faces, which creates a vertical reflection along the sides of the pot. Note that anisotropy only creates the reflection effect, 
if we want the visible grooves, we'd have to create them as a textured normal by adding a noise texture to a bump node and connecting that to the material's normal input. And that's an awful lot of information just to make slightly more realistic pots and pans. But this effect is found in a lot of materials from satin Christmas ornaments to records and CDs like we talked about, brushed stainless steel objects and appliances, jewelry, and even certain gems or minerals like graphite. The next effect is sheen, which adds a soft, subtle reflection to a surface by increasing reflections at low grazing angles. Grazing angles are the angles formed between the incidence rays and the reflective surface. When there are many light rays, some of them will intersect with the surface of your object at a lower angle. When the viewer is aligned with these light rays, the surface of the object will appear brighter. This plane has sheen applied to one side, but no sheen on the other. Looking from high above, the grazing angle is higher and the effect is barely noticeable. But if we lower our view to align with the lower grazing angles, the effect is much more obvious. This effect is most commonly used to mimic soft reflections on cloth materials like velvet or satin, or the fuzz on fruits or plant leaves, and paints with the satin or sheen finish. If we add noise displacement to the plane, we can better see the softer appearance the sheen effect creates. Sheen tint, like specular tint, forces the sheen effect to adopt more of the base color. With no tint, the sheen reflects the color of the light source, but in real world cases, sheen reflections are subtle, adopting more of the material's base color. This is why the default setting for sheen tint is 0.5. The last special case reflection is clear coat. Clear coat adds a clear specular reflection layer that sits on top of the existing material. This is akin to applying a lacquer or protective varnish to an object and is common on finished wood surfaces, some plastics, and finished vehicle paint. This clear reflective layer also has its own roughness, which is only available in cycles with GGX distribution enabled. Clear coat roughness has the same effect as the shader's main roughness. It scatters light within the clear coat layer, which blurs and diminishes the clear coat's reflections. The next three sliders are about transmission, when light passes through a material's surface unobstructed. Any material that you can see through to some degree will have transmission enabled. Since materials are either glass or not, transmission should either be zero or one, where zero is a fully opaque object and one is a material we can see through completely. Using a value between 0 and 1 will result in a mixture between diffuse and glass. IOR stands for index of refraction. Refraction occurs when light passes through an object whose properties change the speed at which light travels. This change in speed results from a change in the densities of the mediums. When light passes from air into water, the increased density of the water slows the light down, causing it to bend. The greater the difference in the density of the mediums, the more light refracts when passing between them. All materials have an index of refraction. The IOR for metallic and specular materials is accounted for in their sliders, but transparent materials have a wide range of refractive possibilities, so we have to specify the value. An IOR of 1 represents the speed of light in a vacuum. As values move away from this number in either direction, the materials appear more solid. There are several IOR resources available online. I'll provide a couple links in the description. Here are some common transmission IOR values rendered. When light hits a glass object, some of the light reflects back to us, enabling us to see the glass object. The rest of the light passes through the glass and reflects off objects behind the glass, enabling us to see them. Roughness affects the light reflecting from the surface of the glass, while transmission roughness affects the light that passes through the glass. This option is only available in cycles and must have the GGX surface distribution model enabled. So let's talk about the surface distribution options. Blender gives us two options for modeling light bounces among surface microfacets. GGX models the first light bounce, but subsequent bounces are ignored. The ignored light rays would have illuminated the interior of the glass, but without them, it appears darker. The rougher the glass, the more noticeable the reduction in light becomes. Fewer light bounces are less accurate, but results in a faster render, and often the difference isn't noticeable. GGX is required if your surface has transmission roughness. Multi-scatter GGX results in more light bounces among the microfacets. When the multiple bounces are accounted for, there is less light eliminated and the resulting material appears brighter. Results are more accurate, but this takes longer to render. This image was rendered with each distribution option. 
The difference is most noticeable when roughness is applied to transmission materials. So surface roughness values are used since transmission roughness does not render with multi-scatter GGX enabled. These emission settings turn your object into a light emitter. A value of 1 results in the emitted light matching the chosen emission color. As the emission value increases, the light gets brighter, moving the emitting color towards white. Alpha is a color component that controls the material's opacity without any regard for refraction. The default value of 1 is fully opaque. A value of 0 is full transparency, rendering your object completely invisible. Remember that normals are vectors perpendicular to a surface that light reflects or refracts around. We often change the appearance of the model by changing the geometry, but we can also change the appearance by changing the normals. Here I have a basic flattened cube. We can tab into edit mode and see the cube's UV map. I have two texture maps, an albedo map, which is a basic color map, and a corresponding normal map. When I connect the color map, we see it on the model, but it appears flat with uniform reflections. When we connect the normal map, it creates the illusion of deformations by changing how light interacts with our model. The fine details are faked by changing the normals, which affect how light reflects around the model's surface. The actual surface hasn't changed. We can also use bump maps to leverage basic black and white images, like Blender's built-in texture nodes. The texture should be connected to the height input where the grayscale values are converted into height information. Areas that are white will appear highest or furthest away from the model surface, and areas that are black will be lowest or closest to the surface. Distance represents the distance of the entire effect from the model surface, and strength is the overall intensity of the effect. Since normal maps don't change the mesh, they are commonly used for fine details. The reflective clear coat can have its own normal map apart from the main texture's normal map. Clear coat materials can have their own textures. Think of a wooden table with a resin coating. The wood's texture comes from the material's normal input, and the resin's texture comes from the clear coat normal. And that's it, all about the principled shader. If you've made it this far, thanks for hanging in there. I learned so much making this tutorial, and I put a lot of effort into passing that info on to you. If you found it helpful or interesting, hit that like button and be sure to subscribe. This helps me figure out what kinds of tutorials to continue to make. Be sure to drop any questions or comments below and keep blending.